Hello and welcome to our first episode of Fuck the Bins, an anarchist podcast coming out of London. Today presented by me, Anna and Johnny. On this podcast, we're going to be covering a range of topics from history, book reviews and culture to anarchist news and events. In this episode, Johnny will bring some news from Indonesia. We will talk about books that inspired us, upcoming anti-fascist call-outs and upcoming events by the Anarchist Federation. On the 1st of May 2018, 69 protesters in Yogyakarta were arrested by Indonesian police and are still awaiting trial, suffering beatings, long periods of interrogation and denied any legal representation while they await their trials. The May Day protests were called against the new Yogyakarta International Airport, which is due to displace about 11,500 people from the area. The farmers were originally gifted the land by the previous sultan as it was deemed to be of low agricultural quality. However, the state is now forcing these people off their farms so they can create a new airport city to stimulate international trade and tourism. As well as threatening local livelihoods, this development risks environmental degradation and loss of life as it will remove sand dunes in the area which offer protection against tsunamis and stop the salination of groundwater. The Indonesian anarchist Black Cross are calling for donations for the legal funds of the anarchist prisoners and the UK Anarchist Federation has sent out 100 quid if you have any spare money, links to donate and more detail can be found at palanghitam.noblogs.org. So, and I always find it interesting to find out which texts have politicised young people and what has influenced someone's political thinking and or their activism. And we all feel it is beneficial to share those texts and encourage each other to look up writing that might not be part of the typical canon of political text, but that is relevant to your own anarchist education. And I think this is often a piece of literature or journalism rather than an academic theoretical text, which encourages someone to look into a particular topic further, or to get to know the history and theory behind certain circumstances, and to become involved in resistance of any sort, really. So, as part of this ongoing podcast project, we would like to introduce our listeners to texts that have inspired us. And today, I would like to start by sharing a short but memorable quote from such a text. One that I first read as a teenager, in which refers to a variety of issues, from the state's monopoly on violence to the media's role in disinformation and the history of protest. The text I have here is called From Protest to Resistance, and was written in 1968. After coming across it by accident, really, I have always felt that it's relevant to me, and it still feels relevant today, 50 years after it was written, even though it is explicitly referring to political events of the time. This short text by a young journalist in Germany called Ulrike Meinhof is now a testament on how frustration with inequality, politics, the state and the treatment of protesters leads to questioning the political system as a whole. Of course, Ulrike Meinhof later went on to be a member of the Red Army faction and died in solitary confinement in 1976. However, in 68, she was a 34-year-old who witnessed the state's violence and her angry essay make it easy to grasp the complexity of violence in a society where meaning and language seem to be dominated by the state's agenda. It's really frustrating to think that the same mechanisms are still at work today, probably even with much greater complexity, and this makes Ulrike's blunt observations even more interesting, I think, and important, and also allows us to try and understand how the interplay between state, society, media and activists functions, and how to at least attempt to break the mould. Not strictly an anarchist essay as such, I think though that the simple language and logical form of this text encourage any young reader simply to question what happens around you, and after all, what if not questioning is the essence of political thinking. So, will we quote this on the nature of protest and resistance, and I quote in translation, protest is when I say I don't like this, resistance is when I make sure that what I don't like does not occur anymore. Protest is when I say, I refuse to go along with this. And resistance is when I make sure everybody else stops going along too. As many of you will have no doubt already heard, in London this week we have visits from both Donald Trump on the 13th of July and the free Tommy Robinson crowd on the 14th, 
in a showcase of both international and homegrown dickheads. Tommy Robinson, the former leader of the EDL, the English Defence League, is currently serving time for jeopardising the outcome of a court case in Leeds where he filmed defendants entering the court while broadcasting the footage. This is part of his crusade to film any Muslim, Muslim in the UK who commits a crime, a somewhat hypocritical endeavour, seeing as a number of his old EDL friends recently got banged up for child sex offences. Will Tommy be exposing the problem of white right-wing paedophiles any time soon? Perhaps not, but why not write to him in prison and ask? Meanwhile, on the outside, Tommy's followers have been organising marches in central London and around the country. When they came through a couple of weeks ago, they were filmed fighting with police and giving Nazi salutes. While one tactic might be, might be to let a load of drunk boneheads get arrested for assaulting a police officer, this is part of a growing problem of far-right resurgence in the UK. Most concerning was that after a free Tommy march in Leeds, the local mosque and Gurdwara were firebombed, a fact that was ignored by most of the mainstream press. The Anarchist Federation has been working with groups across London to organise a counter-demo, which does not involve the SWP, so we'd like to use this opportunity to invite all our listeners to meet at 1pm at Jubilee Gardens on the 14th to oppose neo-Nazis in London. Nearest transport is Waterloo Station, and a big shout-out to comrades in Plan C for leading in this organising effort. As for Trump, well, he's a dickhead as well, so hopefully see you on the streets for that one. Um, as we're once again making call-outs for anti-fascists to take to the streets, I thought it would be a good time to rehash my review of Peter Gelderloos' book, The Failure of Nonviolence. I think this book is incredibly important as it both highlights the need for a diversity of tactics in all struggles, but also warns against the fetishization or valorization of violence. Ultimately, we, as a movement, have got to recognise that the people working behind the scenes to do the accounts for social centres, make banners or publish books are doing just as much, if not more, than the people keeping the fash off the streets and deserve the same recognition. Uh, this review was originally published in Organise, the magazine of the Anarchist Federation. The book itself can be brought from active distribution for the bargain basement price of £5. In The Failure of Nonviolence, Gail sets out his central thesis. Its adherence to strictly nonviolent protest helps the state and favours the preservation of existing power structures, whereas struggles involving a diversity of tactics are more likely to be able to exert meaningful societal change without recuperation. The issue of what violence is and who defines it is also prominent in the book. Proponents of nonviolence often ignore the very real and for many of us day-to-day -day forms of structural violence meted out by the state. They instead focus on a narrow definition involving property damage and confrontations with the police, a definition which is often used by the media to influence the narratives surrounding struggles and generate a moral panic when those involved in struggle do so outside the state's legal framework. Gelderloos highlights a number of examples where the media has used this moral panic both to stifle a struggle and to silence the voices within it. After the police killing of Oscar Grant in 2009 in the USA, there were widespread rioting in the Oakland area. A number of media outlets and proponents of non-violence betrayed this as a response from privileged white male anarchists from outside the community. This narrative was used to silence a cross-sectional response from different members of the community and portray the violence as only being caused by a specific privileged group. Gelderloos argues that this silences the many black, female and queer voices which were involved in the confrontational response to the killing and provides evidence from many groups that the portrayal of the rioting as being down to, quote, manichists was false and patronising to the various groups involved. Jean Sharp and particularly his book, From Dictatorship to Democracy, comes under particular scrutiny due to his non-violent non methods reliance on gaining the support of the media and existing elites to create change. Gelderloos points out that although there have been non-violent revolutions using this method, such as the colour revolutions, referring to revolutions that took place in places like the Soviet Union and the Balkans, these, however, have been political rather than social revolutions. Essentially, one privileged elite is taken over from, the, from another, with more open elections being the only tangible result. This method also falls down when the re regime in question is not reliant on outside capital for trade and when the regime is willing to violently repress ac activists. It is extremely telling when Gelderloos quotes leaked FBI documents which show they have attempted to get protest groups to adopt commitments to nonviolence through the use of infiltrators. This is also backed up by state and military funding for the research and dissemination of the nonviolent method. The strict adherence to non-violence of some American act activists has even led them to unmask members of the Black Bloc, share photos with the police, and physically assault protesters who were damaging property. 
A clear line must be drawn between disagreements on tactics and collaboration with the police, an act which exposes individuals to the full force of state violence. A current within the non-violent movement is that some, somehow more confrontational tactics are acceptable within the global south. Gelaloo's quotes a prominent proponent of non-violence, Rebecca Solnit, who supports the Zapatistas' right to defend themselves and violent actions in Argentina, yet sees any deviation from non-violence within North America to be counterproductive. This is a patronising and almost colonial attitude to struggle which only serves to isolate those involved. Whilst tactics must be clearly adapted to the location they are used, this blanket ban on any confrontational element only weakens the struggle by limiting its options, making it easier for the state to repress or recuperate the movement. What Keldalus calls for, however, is not a fetishised version of violent struggle, but a diversity of tactics where each individual can choose the role they are most suited to. His list of what is needed to achieve social change is worth quoting in full as a rallying call for everyone, no matter what their abilities, to be involved in whatever way they can. To quote Geldaloos, in this multiform struggle that each of us understands in a different way, there is a need for a whole spectrum of activities. Recovering our connection with the land, publishing, spreading our ideas, debating, informing ourselves about the world and the conflicts happening in different places, sabotaging development projects which harm our environment and ourselves, taking care of babies, the sick and the elderly, feeding and healing ourselves, learning self-defence, educating ourselves, providing clothing and shelter, supporting prisoners, running social centres, presses, websites and radio stations, creating a libertarian culture, learning to share and exchange without a logic of accumulation, and learning the roles that have been imposed on us, taking over spaces and defending them, being able to defeat the cops in the streets, shutting down the economy, attacking structures of domination, stopping evictions, organising clinics and workshops, setting up safe houses and underground railroads, recovering our history, imagining other worlds, learning how to use weapons and tools of sabotage, developing the capacity to subvert or withstand the military for when the government decides that democratic repression isn't enough. By placing more importance on some of them than others, those who fetishise illegal and combative tactics miss out on the richness of struggle and the ways by which struggles regenerate. So we call for all anti-fascists to mobilise against the Free Tommy March this weekend, um, but we must remember that there is no great glory in this task. It is simply a chore we must do before we can go back to the even greater work of remaking society. And on a last note, we would like to mention that the Anarchist Federation in London are hosting a monthly reading group, which will be reading and discussing anarchist texts every third th Tuesday at Freedom Bookshop at 7pm. The group is open to all and we aim to help each other understand anarchist analysis without the need for a PhD in philosophy or political science. Our third meeting will be held on the 17th of July, where we will be discussing anarchist economics, alongside practical examples of anarchy in action. The text include an extract from Peter Gadot's book Anarchy Works, as well as essays by Eric Buck and Yuri Gordon. And more details can be found on our blog, aoflondon.wordpress.com. Okay, that's it for the first episode of Fuck the Bins. See you again soon. <laughs>